Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to a live Q&A with me, Phil Lawler, and uh, Adventures in Odyssey. You can see the logo behind me. Isn't this fantastic? We have technology. We can do this sort of thing. This is just great. This is really wonderful. I've been reading over some of the questions that you've been uh, sending in. They're fantastic questions. Boy, some of them are really hard, but I'm going to try to answer as many as I can over the next uh, few minutes, about an hour or so, 45 minutes, an hour or so. I want to tell you about some things that are coming up uh, that I've been involved with. The whole team uh, with the whole team has been working really, really hard to provide more content on uh, on focus at home and on this family time, um, this family time venue that we're doing this right now. So I wanted to tell you about a couple of things that are coming up. Uh, I've uh, done the book on tape for the very first Blackard Chronicles book, which is Opening Moves. That's completed, and it will be uh, it will be out on Focus at Home very soon. You'll be able to hear the whole thing. Uh, we'll put it up there for you and uh, going to do all the other ones. Uh, we've, we've got four books, of course, completed in that series. And uh, the fifth book will be published and out this, I believe, uh, later on this year. So we'll try to get all of those books up for you so that you can hear them. And uh, also, there's a new thing that I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing a little video series called Logophilia. Logophilia is the love of words, and uh, I've been working on some videos for that, and I want to play you the first, that'll also be a release, we'll try to release those one, one a week on the Focus at Home site, and uh, I want to play the first one for you right now, so Nathan, if you can cue it up, roll it. <laughs> Back in the days when keelboats used to haul people up and down rivers, when going against the current, the oarsmen used to grab onto the branches of trees and bushes to help pull the boat forward. Sometimes they'd hang onto those branches a little bit too long, causing them to snap back and slap the person behind them in the face or the head. This practice became known as A. Hack and bushing B. Bushwhacking C. Hack and sacking D. Rathboning. B. Bushwhacking. Why, you low down dirty bushwhacker? Ooh. Don't be a bushwhacker. I'm Phil Lawler. Remember, if you want to write, you have to love words. See you next time. Well, I hope you like that. Uh, I've got a whole bunch more that uh, I'm doing right now. We've got about four or five produced. And again, uh, I'm working on several more for you. Let me know what you think about them. I, I enjoyed doing them a whole lot. Words are a lovely thing. I really do love words. Uh, of course, you have to love words, like I said, if you want to be a writer. And uh, so uh, let, let me know what you think about them. We'll put some more up uh, as the weeks unfold here. Uh, so I want to get to the questions. Let's get to the questions really quickly. Uh, OK, so the first question I have is from Marissa, and Marissa says, if you could visit any fictional place besides Odyssey, where would you go? Oh, that's a good question. I like that question. Um, wow, I think, uh, I think probably Narnia would be a good one. Um, Narnia would be a good place to go. Um, uh, but you know, and I, I think also, you know, Middle Earth would be a good place to go. Uh, it would be a lot of fun. I, I also, um, well, there, there are several, several different places that I'd really like to go. But, you know, the, the thing about that we kind of forget about those things is uh, we read the books and, of course, we're, we're living through the adventures in the books. But when you're actually in that adventure, I mean, I don't know how I would react to a talking lion. I don't know how I would react to a talking unicorn or talking bears. That would be pretty, pretty strange. And even in, even in Middle Earth, when you're talking about, you know, orcs and and ogres and, and, and those kinds of things. I mean, it's one thing to watch that and say, yeah, I'd be, I'd be really brave. I'd be really under, I'd be great, you know, at that point. And another thing to actually be facing one. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's kind, of, kind of different. But definitely Narnia, definitely, uh, definitely Middle Earth. I, I'd really love to, to be in those places, among, among others. Um, Christina, Christina says, what are your favorite Dale episodes that you voiced? My favorite Dale episodes. Uh, let's see. Um, I think the Jesus cloth was one of my favorite Dale episodes. I really enjoyed doing the Jesus cloth. Um, that, that made a really important point about faith and what the object of our faith is. And I just really enjoyed, uh, uh, voicing that one, writing and voicing that one. That was a lot of fun. 
um, other Dale episodes, and, you know, it, it, pretty much all of them. I mean, I really enjoy, I enjoy doing Dale a lot of, I, I'd like to bring Dale back. I think we need to bring Dale back and have him do some things. So let me know if you have any ideas, you know, any of you out there have any ideas for Dale, let me, let me know. We'll, we'll see, we'll see what we can do about bringing him back. Let's see. Um, what do we have here? What else? Uh, what has been your most difficult episode? Emily, Emily writes, what is, uh, has been your most difficult episode to write? The most difficult, wow. Um, the most difficult episode, uh, interestingly enough, I have, I have two stories about that. One was early on when I wrote um, the very first Camp What a Nut episodes. For some reason, those were just so difficult to get out. I, I, I don't know why. They were, they were really, really hard. The very, very first Camp What a Nut episodes. And I remember we were coming up on the recording session and uh, I had to get those things done. And my parents were visiting me at that point and we were supposed to have a, you know, kind of a relaxing time. And I was right in the middle of those scripts and the deadline was happening. We we're going to do a recording session of those kind of at the end of the week. And I was still working on them at the beginning of the week. And it was a two parter. It was a lot of stress, but uh, the Lord was good. And finally I finished them up and we went into the studio and recorded them. And I think that they came out pretty good, pretty good. I, I kind of liked the camp one of that episodes. Um, the, the latest thing was, was a more recent, just very recent in completing the, um, the Maury Rydell, the wrap ups to the Maury Rydell saga. Um, it's a three part episode um, in case it, I think everybody kind of knows that it's three parts. Those three parts were really, really difficult to write. And there are a, ver a variety of reasons for that. Um, not the least of which is I had to take all of these six, six different episodes, six varying different episodes and reconcile all of those things that happened in those episodes together. And that was, that's a, that's a really tall order to do. That's very, very difficult to do. And uh, I hope, I hope it came out. Okay. I think it did. I, I liked them, but uh, we'll, we'll see. You, you can be the judge when you hear them. Um, so, and by the way, that I think somebody actually wrote also, if we're going to be hearing more stories on the Rydell, Maury Rydell stories. Um, and uh, yep, we sure are. We got another one in the works already. And we have a lot of plans for those characters and for what they're going to be doing, Maury and Suzu and uh, how they are involved with Emily and all of those characters. We got lots of stuff planned. So please keep listening. Stay tuned. Great stuff's coming up. All right, so what else? Let's see who else we have. It was difficult. Um, John writes, are there any fun stories about working with Hal Smith? Oh, there are always fun stories about working with Hal Smith. Hal was just such a wonderful human being right from the get-go. He was so kind and he was so uh, generous and, and amazingly talented. Um, a lot of people, a lot of, of folks who are on screen or on television, actors, think that doing voiceover is relatively easy. You don't have to do anything. You just have to stand in front of a mic and make your crazy voices and do stuff. But how, how, and I used to think that, but Hal taught me that, that voiceover is a real art form. It's a specialized art form. And the people who are really, really good at it, uh, they're, they're, they're very special artists. And we have had uh, a lot of those folks on, on Adventures and Odyssey. Uh, we've been very blessed to have such great cast members and great actors work with us. But Hal especially, uh, we thought, you know, we, we, at one point, I remember thinking, well, his voice is kind of generic. It's not that hard. Well, then, of course, when Hal passed away, it was so difficult to find another voice. God blessed us with Paul Herlinger. And now uh, that Paul has passed, he also has blessed us with Andre Stoika. And we have, we have been very, very blessed to find those folks. But, um, you know, they, they, both, they all bring subtle shadings to the character of wit. Um, and, and so it's... It was, it was not, not easy to find, but Hal, Hal was just extremely generous. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you just briefly one story about the, my, my favorite, one of my favorite things that Hal did. Uh, early on in the show, um, in the run of the program, I had a birthday coming up, and my birthday is in August. And so um, little, little known to me, my wife had arranged a surprise birthday party for me. We went out someplace and she took me out and then everybody came over to our house. And when I got back there, everybody was there. And what really surprised me was that Hal Smith came to my birthday. But this is early on in the program, but he came to my party. She found a way to contact him. She contacted him personally, my wife did, and asked him to come. And not only did he come, Walker Edmiston came, Will Ryan came, Katie Lee came. The, the whole cat, the whole, you know, the whole Hee Haw gang, they all came to my surprise birthday party. And that was the moment that I realized that these are not just people I work with, they're also my friends. 
And that was such a wonderful, wonderful feeling that, that they would, uh, they would come all the way out. I mean, I mean, who was, I was, I'm nobody. I'm just, you know, the guy, this duty headed guy who created this program. That's not a big deal. They've done so much more higher level things than I, than, 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 than we had done at that point with Odyssey, certainly, but yet they still all said, yep, we'll come out. We'll, we'll, we'll come out, we'll bring the fans, and we'll, <laughs> we'll have a good time uh, over at the birthday party. And we certainly did, and I was very honored by that. So Hal was just a delightful human being uh, in, in all ways, and uh, I really miss him. I miss him uh, pretty much every day. I, I miss Hal. I have pictures of him in my office, and I'll look up and see him up there and go, oh, I just really miss that man. So great, great man. Um, okay, what next? How do you do casting? Brendan. Brandon, I'm sorry, Brandon writes, how do you do casting for Adventures in Odyssey? Um, by the way, Cal was the one who asked about the more Mori episodes, so I'm glad that you asked uh, Cal, and I hope that answered your question. Yep, we have more Mori episodes coming. So Brandon says, how do you do casting for Adventures in Odyssey? Well, uh, there's a variety of ways. Uh, now, we usually go through agents, um, voice actors who have agents. Um, in the early days of Adventures in Odyssey, uh, we were in a, a non-union program, and because of that, we we look for actors anywhere and everywhere, uh, especially among the kids. And we 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 would hold auditions, just tons and tons and tons of auditions. I remember being in the studio and just holding open auditions, having kids come in and read. And um, a couple of our a couple of our actors, what a, a fun story about that was, uh, <laughs> one of our actresses, uh, Carrie Wal Walgren. Um, she she came into a, a, a session and said, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, well, um, I, I, I think I do, maybe, <laughs> why? And she showed me pictures of when I auditioned her uh, when she was a kid. You know, she's, she's grown up to a beautiful woman, very talented, one of the premier uh, cartoon voice actresses in the country right now. She's really made a great career for herself. And uh, it all started when she came in to a, an open audition that we had for Adventures in Odyssey some, you know, many, many years ago. And, uh, and that, was, that was great. And she showed me the pictures. I have the pictures. I, I wish I could show them to you now, but she had the pictures. She was just a kid. And, uh, and I told her, yeah, you're, 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 you're good. And, and, and that's great. And if we can use you, we will. And I don't think we ever did use her when she was a kid, but we have when she's an adult. So that's good. But yeah, that's how we used to do it. Now, these days, because... Uh, we're a union program, and we have um, we have uh, everybody sends. We, we do things through the through the agents. Um, every once in a while, it'll be some some something else that will happen. We'll get uh, actors in in other ways, but uh, usually it is because we are going through the agents, and um, we audition audition them through the agents, and uh, and we and we have the pick of all the actors who are out there. Um, so that's, that's basically how we do a lot of the casting these days. I'm not really in charge of the casting. That would be our lovely producer, Nathan Hubler, who, by the way, is doing all the behind the scenes work right now. Kudos to Nathan. Thank you very much for all that you do. He's a, he's a spectacular producer. Um, that's he, he, he and Jennifer, um, and, and our assistants, they usually handle all the auditions and stuff. So that, that's how auditioning is usually handled for us. Um, and casting is usually handled for us. So. When can we hear, Angela writes and says, when can we hear some more news on the next Blackard Chronicles book? Well, I just said at the very beginning, if we haven't, if you uh, are tuning in right now, just joining us, uh, that book one of Blackard, I, I have just recently uh, completed reading it as a book on tape, and it will be, um, it will be up at uh, Focus at Home, uh, the whole thing in its entirety very soon, and you can, you can hear that um, in its entirety. Uh, books one through four are already out there. Book five will be released sometime this year. I'm not sure when, but book five is complete. And I'm working on book six. Um, I'm working on the rest of the series right now. Book, book six is next. And book six will involve a name, not a number. And uh, so there's a lot in book six. There's a whole bunch of stuff that needs to happen in book six. I'm going to have to cram it all into the limited amount of pages I have for those books. But there have been a blast to write and uh, had a lot of fun. I want to talk, you know, it's the same thing with the Young Wit books. I'm working on Young Wit book number four right now. Dave Arnold and I are working on that. So I highly encourage you to go out and get the Young Wit books and the Blackard Chronicle books. So 
Those are Blackard Chronicles books. Those are great reads for you right now. They're, they're really, really fun stuff to get out, get in there. The Blackard books themselves, you know, they have a whole bunch of stuff that happened that's behind the scenes that happened that you didn't hear in the program themselves, in the episodes themselves. So it's a lot of new material and you really kind of, really kind of want to, uh, get that new material out there. There's some stuff that I really want to put in about Blackard's background that I just haven't had room to put in. I mean, it, it's just this really interesting, really interesting stuff about where he comes from and what he did in his young years when he was a kid that really plays into what he is doing now. So it's really kind of fun, but um, you have a limited, limited amount of time in order to, a limited amount of space to, to write the story. And so uh, sacrifices have to be made. Maybe I'll figure out, maybe we can figure out some way of putting that on the club or something somehow. So. All right, so next question is from Elizabeth. When Adventures in Odyssey launched, were you scared that families wouldn't like it? Have you ever felt frightened by anything that you're not afraid of now? Wow, those are big questions. When Adventures in Odyssey launched, were you scared that families wouldn't like it? Um, not so much scared that families wouldn't like it. We were, we were told that, um, <laughs> that, well, to put it, to put it sort of bluntly, uh, you, can't, you can't do a weekly program on radio. That, that's sort of what we were told. Weekly dramatic programs, there's no way that they're going to take off and be popular. And so all the odds were really kind of against us uh, as far as that's concerned. All the agencies and all the, all, the, all the people who were the experts were saying, nope, nope, can't do it, Don't, it won't work. You gotta do a daily program. And we were trying to think, how in the world can we do a daily program? That would have made Odyssey kind of like a soap opera. And we really didn't want to do a soap opera. So we thought, well, we're just gonna plow ahead and see if we can make this thing work. And so much to focus on the family's credit, they, they just stuck with it uh, to, to, to make sure that it was always going to go out there where they're always going to do it and um, air, air the program. And uh, then they started getting really good feedback. You know, people wanted to know more. Where, where can we hear more of these? More of these. Give us more. Give us more. And uh, it took about probably about six weeks, maybe it's, it's either six weeks or six months. But uh, after that, it really kind of took off on its own. And, uh, and it's been going strong ever since. So it wasn't so much that we were worried that families wouldn't like it. I was pretty, pr I personally was pretty convinced that families were gonna like what we do, but um, it, it was the experts who just didn't think we could attract an audience and keep an audience from on a weekly show. And then of course, when you have enough episodes, you go daily, so we could do the, the very thing that they wanted to do anyway. You get enough episodes in the can and then you re-air them on a daily basis and you launch a new one every, every week keep the weekly schedule and the daily schedule. And then of course, now we have the club where you can hear all 900 plus episodes or 800 and some odd plus episodes anytime you want. So, um, so yeah, that, there, there was that, um, felt, have I felt frightened by anything that I'm not afraid of now? Uh, I was afraid of a lot of things when I was a kid. <laughs> I was afraid. I was afraid of a lot of things. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's overstating it. There were certain things that I was afraid of uh, when I was a kid. I, 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 I don't remember specifically anything uh, that I was afraid of when I was a kid, but, but I know I had a whole bunch of fears. And, uh, and then, you know, just as you grow older, you learn that you know, there's no real reason to be afraid of anything. Interestingly enough, some of the things that most people are afraid of, I wasn't afraid of at all. For instance, getting up in front of an audience. You know, uh, public speaking uh, is, is the number one fear of most people, public speaking. Death is the number two fear. Death comes in second place to public speaking. <laughs> well, I had no fear of public speaking. I had no fear of getting up in front of crowds and performing and, or anything like that. So I, I wasn't afraid of that at all. Um, and, and I'm not afraid of death really either because I'm a Christian and you know, why should I? I know how the story ends. Um, so. And I don't know if that question was actually related to anything that we've done on Adventures in Odyssey that we were afraid to do or not. I'm taking it as like being personally afraid of stuff. As far as Odyssey itself is concerned, well, we always have cautions about what we present on Odyssey because we know that uh, we have a certain audience that we're appealing to and that we're putting the program out for. And uh, so we have to be kind of careful, but I don't really think that we're afraid to present anything. We just have to, we just have to, to take into consideration how we will present it, what we will do, um, and what we want to say about it. And so I, I think those, that, that's the main thing. It's not a matter of fear. It's just a matter of concern and discernment. We just have to be wise about how we do things, which, uh, which everybody should be. Everybody should be wise about how they do stuff. Okay, speaking of Blackard, Sarah asks, what is the, T, what is the 418 in TA418 stand for? Ooh, 
what does the 418 in TA 418 stand for? Well, if any, if you know the Blackard saga, then you know that that's, you know, that's the formula. That's the formula that helps, uh, helps, helps uh, develop the Ruku. Um, I can't answer that question. You're going to have to wait until book five. Uh, I, I answer the question in book five, uh, but I, I can't really tell you what the 418 stands for at this point, because that would spoil the surprise. You know, I wanted to say something like, yes, 418 was the, the age that my dog died or something like that, or, but it's not, it's not anything like that. It was, it's, 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 uh, there is something there. It does have a significance, but it's, I'm not going to tell you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to wait for book five to come out. Okay. Farm girl, farm girl, lovely name, farm girl. Is that like Harriet farm girl? Your last name is fine. Yes, whatever. Uh, can Eugene and Katrina have a girl named Lauren? Oh, your first name is Lauren. That's my name. Ha <laughs> ha. Lauren farm girl. That's an interesting last name. Uh, can Eugene and Katrina have a girl and name her Lauren? Well, I don't know. <laughs> sure, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll see. I, you know, I don't, I don't know how many kids are in this, in, in, in the works for, <laughs> how do I put this? I don't know what we have planned for Katrina and Eugene, as far as children are concerned. We do have plans for them. Things are going to be happening. In fact, we've got a, I'm working on a, a multi-part episode for Eugene and Katrina both, uh, and that's going to be coming up later on um, within within the next couple of years. We're we're way we're way far ahead as far as where we're, the writing of things are concerned. There's a big delay when we write stuff versus when it's actually produced and and and, and aired. So, uh, but but it's in the works. Uh, it's stuff that's being planned out and starting right now. I can tell you that. Uh, more children are not in the works in, in that particular story arc. Children are not in the works, but who knows? In the future, we'll see. We'll see if, if Eugene and Katrina can have a daughter named Lauren, because Lauren is a great name. Uh, Bethany writes, our son wants to know if Connie will ever get married. <laughs> no. Well, okay, I, you know, I can't, again, we're never going to say never, but at this point, uh, we don't have any any uh, plans for Connie to be getting married at this point. We're going to see what else we can do with Connie first. Connie is this wonderful character who's, uh, you know, an independent woman. It's not that we have, obviously we don't have any objections to, mar to marriage in general, but it, it will significantly change her character. I mean, if, if that happens, we just know how significantly it will change her character. Look at, look at how Eugene has changed since he was married. And that's fine. All of those things are really good and we can explore and examine how all those things work. But I think we still have more to do with Connie before before we have her take that big step. I know everybody wants Mitch to come back or Jeff to come back or this person to kind of that person or she meets somebody new or she marries Jason or what. I I know I know I know I see the message boards too, and I know everybody would really like. There are a lot of people out there who would really like to see it, and then there are an equal number of people out there who say no. Why Why should Connie get married? She doesn't need to get married. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're considering that. When we have our writers' meetings, that is definitely a topic of conversation. What are we going to do with Connie? Are we going to get her married? So, again, again, we, 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 uh, we don't personally know the future as far as that one is concerned. We haven't really discussed it a lot, but who knows? We'll see. Maybe, maybe. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, another Elizabeth, or maybe this is the same Elizabeth who writes, have you ever had people send you stories to do as an episode? Uh, yes, yes, we've had people send us stories to do as an episode. Uh, in fact, a lot of people have sent them in. Most of them we have not uh, not done, quite frankly. Um, we, we're very appreciative of fans' uh, feedback and fans' ideas, and uh, we do uh, we do um, uh, consider some of them. Uh, some of the times we don't uh, consider them. We, we most of them we we probably I don't want to say we don't read them. But somebody somebody reads them at Focus on the Family. But when it gets to our level of the, the, the creative part of it, we 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 kind of avoid that a little bit. And the reason why is because um, if we're working on a similar story, or even later on we come up with a, a story and it's similar to something that we've read, well, we don't want anybody to say, "Oh, you stole my story." Oh, no, 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 read this. So we kind of we kind of stay away from that. We 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 uh, we. we we want to make sure that we're not going to be stepping on anybody's toes or making people upset. Um, I, I can tell you, uh, though, that there are personal stories, even recent stories. So um, a wonderful uh, lady named Sarah, um, 
uh, recently shared, she became, I became f Facebook friends with her and we talked and she shared her personal story with me about, um, about her a physical condition that she has with her eyes. And I asked her if I could write that up as an Odyssey story. And, and she said, yes, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be able to, to, to have that happen. And so um, that story uh, became, and for the life of me right now, I cannot think of the name of the story. I wrote the story and I can't think of the name of it. <laughs> I says, this is what happens when you're, when you're um, trying to talk and trying to remember stuff at the same time. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. Rightly dividing. Rightly dividing is the name of the story. And so, um, yeah, th that, was a, that was a story that uh, was about Sarah and her, her personal journey with, uh, with her vision, with uh, operations that she has to have and some of the things that uh, happened to her personally. And I got permission from her to actually tell that story. And it, I think it was a wonderful, wonderful little affecting story. And she was, Sarah was actually able to come out and be a part of the, uh, with us on the recording session. And, uh, and, and it was just a really, really lovely experience. So, so yes, uh, absolutely. There are, there are times when we will, um, we will take things that fans have sent into us or in conversations with fans uh, that something comes out that, that, that we feel like may, would make a really good story. And we, and we do that. So, yeah. Um, all right. Let's see. Benjamin writes, do you feel like you are writing for the same audience that you were writing for back in the late eighties and nineties? For example, parents once complained about the character of officer David Harley. Do you think this character would have received the same reaction today? How have audience audiences attitudes and concerns change that's a great question that's a really really good question um i i don't think that we're writing for the same audience that we were writing for back in the 80s and 90s uh, a lot of things have happened um if you if you not to get too philosophical on this but we seem to be living in a kind of a postmodern generation right now in a postmodern world where we weren't doing that when we first started the, the show in in back in the, the late 80s and the 90s um, so we had certain certain cultural presuppositions uh, back then. Um, you know, we we kind of uh, assumed that everybody understood the Bible, everybody understood certain things, even in the popular culture. Well, we can't we we can't make that assumption anymore. There's a lot of things that have happened in the popular culture that are just different, just just way way different. Kids are facing different ideas. The the whole thing of the internet. The internet, cell phones, uh, technology has has changed virtually everything, and so it's it's new challenges. It's new. It's the 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 morality and the virtues are the same, but we have to apply them in new ways, and that's where we're we're always looking um, for for that's where new story ideas come 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 up and new story fodder comes into play. Um, you know, a character like Officer David Harley, that's that's a very interesting character. I, I think he probably wouldn't survive even today, <laughs> um, you know, if we had a character like that. I mean, the, the, the thing that was really touchy about Officer David Harley is that he was a police officer. Uh, we, we, we came up with all sorts of ways to try to salvage the character, try to save the character. And, um, you know, we, 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 made the, we made the point, which is a really valid point, is an accurate, valid point of that when he's a police officer, when he's trying to be a police officer and doing police work, he's very, very straightforward and does it really, really well. It's when he's having kind of conversations with people uh, that he got very bumbling and very, very funny. And he was, a, he was really fun to, to write for. But, um, but that was, you know, looking back, I think you know, the, the listeners had a, a valid point. The folks who were complaining that we were trying to make fun of police officers, I think they had a valid point. So, you know, we, we kind of changed and got, got rid of David Harley and uh, brought in Harlow Doyle. And uh, he sort of took up the slack on that. So, um, but yeah, I, I think that it's a, it's a really different world uh, now than it was when we first started this program. And, uh, and we, we make a big mistake if we think that, if we, if we make the assumptions that we're kind of dealing with the same group of people, because we're not. Um, and we have to reach them in different ways. So it's, it's always, a, always a great challenge, always a great way of uh, working on Odyssey. And it's, uh, I think that uh, you know, God is, is providing all of us with our own lessons in our personal lives and in our study um, to, to be able to handle some of the new situations that are coming up, some of the new, the new uh, problems and crises that are happening in families and with kids these days. And we're trying to, we're trying to do a lot of episodes to answer that so, um, and, and talk about those things and address those issues. So yeah, that's great, great questions, Benjamin, great questions. Uh, Jamie 
writes, how old is Mr. Whitaker? I'll never tell. <laughs> how old is Mr. Whitaker? Well, you know, I think, I think he's, he's actually, you know, in it. In a different world, he's Doctor Who. He's a Time Lord. He's just, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for saying that. He, I, I, we, he, he, I can't tell you how old Mr. Whitaker is. <laughs> you have to read the Young Wit books. That'll, that'll give you an idea of how old he is. But then the Young Wit books may confuse you because you might say, well, yeah, but wait a minute. How does that match up with this? And how does that match up with that? And wait a minute. Hold on. Every, well, maybe it'll be confusing. Maybe it won't. But uh you know, the nice thing about, uh, hopefully, about what we've done with Odyssey is that it's timeless. I know that people really, really want to peg it to a certain time, a certain time frame, and a certain timeline. And, and yes, we want to try to be as consistent as we can with that. But, you know, it, sometimes the needs of the story it just out, outweigh the, the, the things. There's, there's real time, as I say, and then there's, there's Odyssey time. So you kind of have to accept the fact that it's Odyssey time. It's called the suspension of disbelief. You just have to go with it. All right. Um, Austin, Austin. Hey, hey, Austin, how are you doing? Uh, will we hear from Becky Riley Clemens soon? I loved hearing her in Legacy and Angels and Horsehair. I would love to hear more from her and have her tell stories of her and Tom growing up. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I think we will hear from her um, uh, soon, I hope. I hope we have some more stuff that we have. Um, we have some more stuff that we're trying to trying to do with her. Uh, I really like her character, and I really like writing for her. She's a lot of fun to deal with. So, um, and, and to and to put her in different kinds of situations, she's very spunky, and she does have kind of that Tom Riley characteristic to her, which I find to be really fun. Um, so, yeah, I want to I want to do more with her a lot, a lot more with her, uh, and hopefully we will see her again soon. Um, so, there we have it. Yep, yep. Um, Benjamin, same Benjamin, Benjamin writes, when you returned to work for Adventures in Odyssey, were you surprised by any changes or storylines that had happened on the show while you were gone? Which one surprised you the most? Um, I, I wasn't surprised, uh, surprised would be the wrong word. I was, um, I was, uh, sort of concerned, but concerned for me, uh, that I hoped I'd be able to, to catch on to all the changes that had happened. There were, there were quite a few, not the least of which was the character of Wooten, who had risen to uh, such prominence on the program. And uh, I, I didn't know anything about that character at all. And I still don't know a whole lot about Wooten. Um, but uh, um, but he, he, was, he was the biggest concern for me because I, you know, I, I obviously have to figure out a way to write for him and uh, to put him into, into, uh, into adventures and make sure I understand his character really well. So the, the character, the characters themselves, there were, you know, there's the Parker family. I had no idea who the Parker family were. Um, there, in fact, there was whole families. I was gone long enough that there were a whole set of families that had come and gone in the time that I was not on the program that I didn't know anything about. The Washington family was a good example of that. And so when I, when I wanted to go back and do something or I wanted to, you know, pitch new ideas to the team, they would say, well, the Washington family had, did this and this and this. So for instance, in the, in the script, the toy, uh, I had Ed Washington come back in, in Ed, I think his name is Ed, Ed Washington come back and, um, and, you know, there was a whole history there that I hadn't, I had no idea about. And I had to go back and research him. I had to go back and figure out where he was and who he was and why he uh, why, why he was not in odyssey anymore but in connellsville and the whole the whole bit and um and it, and it worked out really well it fit really well and the toy ended up being a really delightful episode a uh, very touching episode too so um yeah that, th there were a few things a few things but it again it wasn't it wasn't so much me uh thinking that it was uh, you know su uh, being surprised as it was again kind of concern with uh, with how much was different and what what uh, what I was going to have to kind of learn. So, um, Becky Becky writes, "What do you think your daughters Robin and Melanie Jacobs are up to these days?" Well, I think that Robin um, Robin is a got her PhD in psychology and is a practicing psychologist, and Melanie is probably doing something in the missions field. That's what I think they're doing. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, 
Robin was always very, very smart and very outgoing and snappy. And, and so was Melanie. And so I think, I think they're both doing very, very well. I think they're both married. They probably, they both have kids and uh, it'd be great if they call home more. They need to call their father more. Yeah. You know, I sound like an old Jewish guy. Call your father, call your father, Robin, Melanie, call your father. All right. <laughs> Uh, Stephanie writes, what's a favorite funny studio memory from your time working on Adventures in Odyssey? Any favorite lines that were actually improv by the actors? Um, the second question first, yes, there were improvs all over the place. Let it be known right now, here and now, that Will Ryan will do anything and everything to have the last word or even sound in a scene. He wants to be the very last thing that you hear on any scene that he is in. So, uh, and so that's a lot of that is ad libbing and, and just him doing things that are very funny. Um, I think uh, uh, some of the funny studio things were Keith Robinson plays, I think Keith uh, Robinson plays uh, Ted Humphreys. That is, I, I'm pretty sure that's, the, that's correct. Nathan, that is correct, right? I think Keith Robinson plays Ted Humphreys. Uh, Keith Ferguson. I'm sorry. Keith Ferguson plays uh, Ted uh, Ted Humphreys, and um, he, he, whenever he does that character, it's there's no. He he just we're, we're on the floor laughing so hard because he he just delivers the line so funny. He is he is he's got that character down so well, um, and oh my goodness, yeah, it, those are just great great times. And usually uh, there are a lot of things that will happen where um, ad libs that will happen when, it, when a person is really into a character, they'll say stuff, uh, something will just come out. Um, and, and a lot of times uh, the funniest lines are ad libbed and then we'll say, okay, now you have to do that again. You'll have to, you'll have to actually do it again and this time make it, make it part of the scenes because we take, we take each, te each scene several times when we're doing the recording. And, um, and so that's, that's, the, that's the, the most fun uh, uh, times is, is, is when you're in the studio. Um, yeah, I, I told this to Dave Arnold the other day and I said, you know, it, when Teddy Roosevelt, the last thing that Teddy Roosevelt ever said was he lived, he lived in a, in a place called Sagamore Hill and he was going to bed one night with his wife and he said, I don't think you'll ever know how much I love Sagamore Hill. And he went to sleep that night and never woke up. That was the last thing he ever said to her or to anybody. His last recorded statement. And so I told Dave, I said, uh, <laughs> I said, I don't think anybody will ever know how much I love being in the studio. And that's really true. And um, I, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I said that and then just kind of hoped that that wouldn't be the last thing that I would say to anybody at that point. So, and, and thank God it wasn't so. But at any rate, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to be. It's a whole lot of fun. It's hard work. It's really hard work. And I think a lot of times folks want to come in and they want to visit us in the studio. And then they realize, okay, a lot of this is, gets a little bit tedious if you're not really actively involved. It's really fun for about the first five or ten minutes. And then after that, you realize, okay, well, this is just sort of repeating the process. It's very repetitive. And because we're trying to get the, the right reads on the lines, we're trying to get into the, make sure all the technical stuff is right. And that just that just gets to be kind of tedious after a while. Um, but I, I love every minute of it. I've always loved being in the studio and most, mostly because it's so much fun to be around these folks. Um, uh, our, our Avir, our Avir, our Avir, I hope I'm saying that right. Has there been a time when you've written a character and after finishing recording, you wish you could add in different lines and make scenes differently? Yes, all the time, virtually every show. Virtually every single script, um, and I, I, I don't want to speak for everybody else, but I think I, they probably feel the same way. You, you hear it back and you go, oh, I wish I could have done something differently. I wish I had said that, or I wish I could have made it play a little bit differently. Uh, we, try to, we try to do as much work as we possibly can going into a show, especially from the writing standpoint. Um, the script is the easiest thing to change. It's not, it's not easy. <laughs> I mean, a script is your baby, and you don't want to have to change things too much. Because uh, you really, really put a lot of yourself into every script. But um, from the standpoint of just technically and 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 uh, logistically, the script is the easiest thing to change. Whether you make cuts or whether you make additions or whatever else, the script is the easiest thing to change. Once you get something recorded, it's a lot harder to change it. 
So you want to try to do as much work up front on the scripting end before you ever go in to record the studio or to record the script in the studio. And uh, but even so, uh, after all that work that you go to put into it, when you're in there and, and, and that that, by the way, includes while you're recording. So you can change stuff while you're recording. Let's move this around here. Let's change this line. Let's do this. Let's do that. There's a lot of stuff that, that a lot of changes that are made in the script while you're recording it. Um, but then at the playback, you know, you hear it again and you go, oh, man, I just wish you had a different read on that line or I wish we had done a different line period. I wish there was something else that was going on. Or maybe these scenes could have moved around a little bit more. I could have, maybe I'm missing a scene. I wish I could have had more time to add that scene. Usually what goes on though is uh, once we get everything recorded, then the production engineers will put everything together, the sound designers. They'll send it to back to us who are to the writers and directors and say, okay, we're, we're going to be long. And very rarely do we come in on time or are short. It's always we're going to be long, so we have to cut stuff. So what you're hearing is a, a, an edited version. You're not hearing everything that we actually put into the scripts. You're going to hear, you know, sometimes there's whole scenes that are taken out. Sometimes it's just a half a scene. Sometimes it's really surgical. You have to go in and remove part of a sentence or just a section of the scene. Um, and, and sometimes it's really, really good stuff. I, I have to say, sometimes it's really good stuff. The, the first thing that usually goes is jokes. Jokes are, you know, jokes and funny stuff are usually the first thing that goes. So, um, and that's, a, that's sad. So, you know, you always want to try to write your scripts so that the humor is an integral part of the story. So that way it can't be so easily cut, but uh, that's very difficult to do. So sure. There are always changes. Changes are always going to be made. And, um, that's just the nature of the beast. That's just the way we work. Abby, Abby writes in and says, what did you do while you were not working for adventures and odyssey? Um, what did I do? Well, <laughs> uh, I, I got multiple college and university degrees, for one thing. Uh, I, I went back to school and got an associate degree and liked it so much. It was in philosophy, and I liked it so much that I said, oh, I'm going to go ahead and get a bachelor's degree. So I went ahead and got two bachelor's degrees. One was in philosophy, and the other was in radio, TV, and film. And then I liked that so much, I said, you know what, I, I need to keep going. I'd kind of like to teach this. And the only way to teach that at the university level is to get a Master of Fine Arts degree. So I went back and got an MFA in, um, in script writing and video production. And so that's, that's a, a, a big chunk of what I did. That, that took up a lot of time. Um, so, I, I mean, I started, I think, in, I started that in the year in 2000, 2001, I think. Yeah, it was 2001. It was right around when the towers fell. That was my first semester back in college, back in school. And, um, and I finished up everything and in, in, uh, finished all those up in 2011. So it took that long to go back, basically way, way back to the very beginnings. So don't let anybody ever tell you that, you know, college will always be there. I don't think it's necessarily, um, this is my own personal opinion. I don't think it's necessary for you to have a college degree in order to do what I, what we do here or, or most jobs, I think actually. I think you can get on-the-job experience and on-the-job training, which is just as valuable as a college degree. I don't think you have to go to college necessarily. But I think education is a wonderful thing, and uh, especially if you go to the right schools and get the right professors. And uh, it's always going to be there. And I'm one of those cases. I'm a living example of somebody who went back to school when he was in his 40s. And I started over. I, when I was, I was in my 40s when I went back to school. Um, and I started over from the very beginning. I, I, uh, I, I took placement tests and I could, I could have gone into higher classes, but I said, nope, I want to go back to the very beginning, especially in things like math, which I was never very good at. I wanted to go back to the very beginning and, and, uh, and I did, and I don't, I, it was a great experience. I really enjoyed it a lot. And, um, and now, you know, have ended up uh, being a professor myself for nine years. So, um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, that's, that's, that's the bulk of what I was doing. I also wrote a whole bunch of stuff. I worked for um, I did a bunch of stuff for uh, Roma Downey. Um, she had a, a, a series called The Little Angels that I wrote for her and, and wrote and direct voice directed for her. I wrote a bunch of uh, other, I worked on a bunch of other cartoons. I was one of the voice directors for Hi Hi Puffy Ami Yumi. Uh, I did a lot of voices on a show called Space Racers. I did a bunch of voices for a show called Funny Face. I did a bunch of voices, including a recurring character for the new Tom and Jerry shows. Um, so I did, I did a whole bunch of stuff. I, I just, just varying and sundry things, um, that, that I really enjoyed working on and, um, and, um, and God was very good to me. So I was, I was very gracious and I really, but I really wanted to come back to Odyssey and I really am glad that, um, that there was a place for me when I came back. Uh, praise God. Um, so Benjamin again writes, you've written a lot of historical episodes. 
whose story from the past have you always wanted to tell on Adventures in Odyssey, but haven't had the chance? Um, a couple of them, actually. One, I was thinking about it this morning. I pitched this idea a couple of times, but I haven't really developed it. Uh, there's a guy named Eddie Rickenbacker, and he was a World War I flying ace. And he was a, a, an American who um, was early, early on. And if you know anything about about uh, World War I and the pilots in World War I, their life expectancy in the air, <laughs> from the takeoff to the air, was very short. And uh, um, so... Uh, he, but he survived the war. He was a he was an an ace pilot, and uh, then he helped develop the Army Air Corps after the war between between World War One and World War Two. And in World War Two, he was he was a high ranking officer, a war hero, high ranking officer. Had done a lot of stuff in his life, and ended up going on a mission in the Pacific, and his plane was shot down. Now, if you know anything about uh, the movie Un Unbreakable, Unbreakable, I think it is. Um, with Louis Zamperini, uh, he had a similar story where his plane was shot down, and then he and his he and a couple of other guys uh, lived on a on a raft for a long, long time. Floated for several weeks, actually. Um, they were out before they were captured by the Japanese and put into a, a, a Japanese prison camp. And the same thing happened to Eddie Rickenbacker. There were more. I think there were more people on that life raft, and I think they were out there for a longer period of time than Louis Zamperini and his friends were. So, uh, but it's the same kind of thing. And the thing that got him through it was his faith. The thing that got him through him and everybody else around him, they were, they were so, um, so filled with despair and, and lack of hope, but he kept them all buoyant to, uh, because of his faith. And I would really like to tell that story. That's a very, very interesting story. Um, another one that comes to mind is the Wright brothers. Uh, I think it would be a lot of fun to do the Wright brothers story. Here's a, a couple of guys who, who were technically minded engineers. And uh, of course they made bicycles. They had a bicycle shop and just wanted to do something that was so interesting. Their flight was, uh, became an obsession with them. They wanted to see if human beings could fly and built planes and built planes and finally took them off. And then, you know, the, 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 the wonderful thing about that, it, when you think about it, is uh, it, it, in a very short period of time, they went from that 12, 15, 20-second flight, 30-second flight, whatever it is on Kitty Hawk in North Carolina, um, really short a period of time to having jet engines and, 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 and rocket ships and, and putting people on the moon. You know, and, and I think it was less than 60 years from the inception, from, from Kitty Hawk to the time when, when people, uh, you know, when, when man went to the moon. Now, I know a lot, there are a lot of people out there who say, mankind has never really gone to the moon. But you can't argue with the fact that we do have men going to outer space. We have we, people are, are in outer space. We have a space station up there. And all of that is directly attributable to these guys who are uh, so technically minded and really loved uh, to wanted to use their talents to unlock the keys of flight that God, the secrets of flight that God put into everything. Um, and use the, the, the technology that God provided to see if human beings could actually fly. And uh, I think it's just a great story. In those, just, so there's a, couple, there's a couple of them there. And of course, there's all sorts of other like war stories and stuff. I would, I would really love to do, um, if there's any way to do this, I would really love to do, and I, we've been talking about doing something like this on, at Odyssey, on Odyssey as well. I would love to do a, um, a, a multi-story arc following uh, the life of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. I'm a big Civil War buff, and I would like to do the life of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain as he went through the Civil War. Maybe even afterwards too. But it would be a, a monumental story arc. There's a there's a gentleman named Indy Nidell, and he does online right now. When when World War One that was the hundredth anniversary of World War One, he did a weekly ten minute podcast week by week by week of what happened in World War One. It's called the Great War, and he and he did it in real time. So when World War One started, he went until until the war finished in in uh, from 1914 to 1918 um and now he's doing world war ii so he he finished world war ii it's not 100 years since world war ii started but he decided to go ahead and do world war ii and now he's doing that week by week what what happened this week what happened this week what happened this week and uh, and i would love to do something like that on odyssey uh, just maybe on the club or something where we have we follow a character we say you know or or, or just do the civil war you know this week in the civil war it happened this week here's what happened. And then the next week, 10 minutes of here's what happened. And the following week, here's what happened. And here's what happened. And here's what happened. And kind of do it real time. And I, I, that would just be a, a, a blast. I think it would be so much fun. There's so many rich, wonderful stories in that time period. Um, and we've only, we've only scratched the surface about telling them on Odyssey. So uh, that would be great. I, I would love to do something like that. History is one of my favorite things. Um, Becky, 
Becky writes, who is your favorite minor obscure character to voice? <laughs> and she, she says, I love the grocery clerk from Cell Perks. Wow. Um, I, 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 I've done, I think, almost 200 voices uh, on Adventures in Odyssey. And most of them have been done because necessity is the mother of invention. So, uh, you know, a lot of those voices were like one or two lines. And we didn't want to hire an actor to do the one or two lines. So I just went in and did them and then tried to come up with a voice. And, and you know, most of the time we, it stayed. Uh, sometimes it didn't. But um, <laughs> so I, uh, I, I have done so many of those. It's really hard for me to remember. But usually it's something that is like very sarcastic. If I had something that was really sarcastic, a line that was really sarcastic, that would probably be among my favorites. But again, I, I don't remember the specific characters. I do remember some of the bigger characters. So I really enjoyed doing Captain Quid. Um, I, I really enjoyed that. I really, my favorite, I think one of my favorite voices to do is, and I've done this a lot, a, a couple of times, I think in BTV, is the Jim Backer's voice. I really love that voice. He's such a, an Ivy League sort of character. And I really, really love having him be a part of the show so that 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 voice is a lot of fun to do and uh i i really uh, between him and quid i matey quid is a wonderful character well i i really love those voices i think those are some of my favorites uh okay so mia age nine if you were one of the adventures and odyssey characters who would you be well i would be dale jacobs because that's who i am um I think I think uh, I would probably if I if I had to be somebody in real life. So if if I was given the choice to say you could be one of the characters in Odyssey, who would you be? Then I probably I, I think it would be Wit, and I, I think that's true because so much of creating Wit, um, what I did with Wit was I put a lot of my father into Wit, and um, my father was uh, was a wonderful man, and he was a great man, and he taught me a lot of things. He he was not a famous man. He never did arrive, uh, uh, you know, rise up on the scale of fame. But that was okay. He enjoyed. He, he he actually he actually desired a quiet life, but his quietness. He, he taught me a whole a lot of things, and um, and he was a, a solid, strong Christian man. And I really loved him, and I miss him a lot. And uh, so a lot of what a lot of what wit became was things that my dad had taught me. A lot of my dad is in wit, so I think it'd probably be wit. Probably be wit. Um, Stephanie writes, I noticed that Buck, who is 16 years old, and Emily, 12 years old, and Matthew, 10 years old, were all in the same locker room and cafeteria in the ties that bind. I thought that Matthew would be in elementary school, Emily in middle school, and Buck in high school. Are the Odyssey schools not separated? Um, no. Uh, there are there are schools in smaller towns where you have the high school, the junior high, and the elementary school all within very close proximity to each other. Um, so that's kind of what we're going for here. So the idea behind it is that while they might not always be in the same building, so there could be several buildings on the school property, they're not necessarily always in the same building. Sometimes they will be in the same building, uh, in the same locker area, for instance, that sort of thing. Um, and they would, they would all have kind of proximity with each other. They would all be kind of in close proximity with each other. So, um, so I, I, I think that's kind of the best answer that we can give, you know, again, uh, <laughs> this, this is going to sound sort of mercenary, but we, we, we kind of have to do what the needs of the story dictate and, uh, and, and then, and then sort of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a rule in golf where you, you go ahead and hit the ball and apologize later. If you can take the shot, you take the shot. And then if it's going to, you know, if it's going to interfere with what somebody else is doing, you apologize later. Uh, that, that's kind of sometimes what we do with Odyssey. You know, we do stuff and then we kind of explain it later. So the best explanation that I can give you is all of those buildings are sort of in really close proximity to each other. And so the kids, all the kids, no matter what their age, ages are, individual ages are, are going to interact with each other quite a bit. Um, okay, so we're about ready to wrap this up. We've been going for quite a while. I've enjoyed all of it. Good grief. I, I, I hope that we can do more of this stuff in the future. I really, really like this. Uh, this is the penultimate question. Penultimate, maybe that's a word I will do on logophilia. Penultimate question. That means the next to the last one. So this is the second to the last question. Uh, we'll do a couple more here. In the episode, The World of Wittonia, 
Witt comments on the unusual colors René used when creating Batonia. One of the things he says that jumped out uh, at me was the sky is green, but the light is golden. Is this by any chance reference to the Robert Frost poem, Nothing Gold Can Stay? Wow, good catch. That is really, really good. I'm very, very pleased. Yes, actually it is. It, it actually is a reference to that. But uh, not, not, you know, it's not like I was, I read the poem and said, I want to do that in there. I was really just thinking more in terms of the imagery than anything else. Um, I, I love Frost's poems, um, but I am, um, uh, I wasn't specifically thinking of that when I wrote that, but although uh, I think that was in the back of my mind uh, when, when, uh, when I was writing that episode, but that's a very, very good catch. Yes. You know, I, that brings up another point about Odyssey. We put all sorts of stuff like that in every single episode. There are literary references, there are lines from popular culture, there are lines from classic literature, there are lines from Shakespeare, there are references. One of the reasons I wanted to do Logophilia is to show everybody that these words are really important and the concepts in the lines that we use and the way that we use words in lines, very, very important. They harken back. It's really an amazing thing. Communication and speech are amazing things. In the beginning was the word, the word. How did God create the world? He spoke it into existence. Spoken word. And who was that word? That word was Jesus. And that's just an amazing thing. And we have been gifted, divinely gifted with the divine gift of speech. All of us have words, using words, written words, spoken words, and we need to use them. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do Logophilia. And, uh, uh, and it's also one of the reasons that I became a writer. It's one of the reasons that I hope everybody out there understands the importance of the written word and the spoken word and will do everything they can to increase their vocabularies and use words eloquently and, well, and, and for the greater good. So, but good catch. Very good catch, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Oh, I mean, yes, Emily, not Steph uh, Stephanie, good question from you, but Emily, also good catch. All right, and this is the, to wrap everything up here, Noah, Noah says, if you could say anything to the fans at this moment, what would you say? Um, well, I think I just answered that in Emily's question, actually, about words. Um, if I could say anything to the fans, it would be keep the faith. Uh, I know that these are difficult times, um, but again, we're doing everything that we can to help, help you all out and, uh, and try to provide good stuff for you to watch and listen to and uh, bring things like this to you that we can and then logophilia all the other stuff that we're doing um, all the interviews that we've done and all the stuff that we're going to do in the future one of the things that we have coming up by the way that i just want to mention is and you can keep us in prayer for this we're gonna we're still recording adventures and odyssey episodes so we're using the technology that god has graciously provided for us um, we're, we're going to, we're going to try to record a, a our, our very first, uh, remote recording of an adventures and odyssey episode on Monday. So if you all will please keep that in your prayers, we, we are praying for success on that. We're going to have to work out some technical bugs. We, we did a trial run yesterday and it went very, very, very well. Um, and, uh, with a few little, few little kinks that we have to work out, but please keep that in your prayers. Um, and because we, we want to keep bringing these things to you, we want to do what God wants us to do. And we want to keep bringing these episodes to you, even, even in the midst of this crisis. So what I would say to you right now is just keep the faith, always turn toward God, turn your hearts toward him. Um, go about your daily work, go about doing the tasks that are in front of you to this day. One of my favorite stories from my youth, a preacher from my youth said, uh, um, he told a story about a ball player, a baseball player who was a Christian and they, um, they asked him, uh, he's a pitcher and they asked him, a reporter asked him and said, you know, what, what would you do if you were in the middle of the world series, if you were in the middle of a ball game and Jesus came back, you heard that Jesus was coming back in 10 minutes, what would you do? And he said, I'd finish the ball game. And that's the idea behind what we should be. We should be so confident in Jesus, so confident in our faith that we go about our daily tasks and we don't worry about the other stuff. So that's what I would say to you right now. Just keep the faith, um, be kind to one another and uh, use this opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better and to do wonderful things with each other, with your family. And, uh, and that, that would be what I would say right now. That would be really important. So again, uh, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for family time. Thanks for watching. I hope you've 
hope you didn't mind my rocking back and forth. I have a lot of energy and <laughs> I know that my chair was squeaking and, and I rock back and forth and it could be very distracting. And I hope that I didn't distract you too much. And I answered a lot of your questions. I've had a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, I hope we can do this again soon. And I hope to see you uh, soon on Adventures in Odyssey. Come and join us on our side of the radio for more Adventures in Odyssey. We'll see you all very, very soon. God bless.